Welcome to another episode of Journeys in Entrepreneurship. Today, we have Lai Koike, the CEO of Green Springs Educational Services Limited, one of the leading British international schools in Nigeria. Her over 38 years of passion, groundbreaking innovations, and commitment to education has set her apart in the educational sector in Nigeria. She has also provided strategic leadership to Green Spring School as an educational instructor, leader, and administrator since its inception in 1985. Her passion is evident from the excellence of the school to her relationships with students, staff, parents, and the community at large. As part of the annual CSR for the educational sector, Green Spring School hosts thousands of teachers and school owners to an annual open house where teachers from other Nigerian schools can visit the school to learn from her practices. Lai Koiki is also a founding member of the Association of Private Educators in Nigeria, APEN, a member of its Board of Trustees and currently its chairperson. She also serves on the Board of Teach for Nigeria. Interviewing her is Anuolua for Akinola, the founder and centre director of Extra Old Kids Child Care Centre. A visionary endeavour, Anuolua for established to provide a nurturing haven for children under five years old. Leading a dedicated team, she orchestrates a comprehensive blend of custodial care and educational services that lay the foundation for lifelong learning. Anuolu Apo is an alumnus of our Scale-Up Lab Education Accelerator program and has over two decades of dedicated experience in the field of early childhood education. Join us as we listen to their journeys in entrepreneurship in the education sector. Hi, my name is Anu Akiola, and I'm the Center Director at Extra Old Kids Child Care Center, where we provide educational and child care services for children 0 to 5. I'm thrilled to welcome you to another session, podcast series, Journeys in Entrepreneurship at the Faith Foundation. Today, I'm honored to be seated with the, a true luminary in education sector, Mrs. Lai Koiki, the founder CEO at Green Springs School Lagos. Good morning, Ma. Good morning. It's really a delight. I'm excited. I don't even know the words to say. <laughs> you know, when I was invited for this session, I thought, who? Me? Yes, you. <laughs> you know? I was really excited, you know. And you know, one of my excited excitements, apart from the fact that of course, you are you're a veteran in, in the education industry. You are well known for your good work and the like. But also that in my home, you are somebody that, you know, you are, a, you are a household name in our house. My children attend your school. In fact, oh, wow. my two children oh, attend wow. your school. So oh, I would wow. say that this is not just a mere coincidence. It's a divine orchestration. Mm, thank you so much I'm and excited. i'm really happy to be here I'm really excited to be here and to meet you as well because <laughs> really i'm meeting you for the first time yeah, it's, oh wow what a, what a coincidence yes. divine i would say <laughs> yes, okay spirited. wow what a beautiful day today i'm really excited <laughs> and you know uh, i i can't wait to you know to delve into your knowledge your your experience and of course your insights you know, let me start by asking, you know, based on the fact that you have had four decades, you know, it has been four decades in the educational mm -hmm. industry, you know, what made you start? Mm -hmm. If you reflect on your journey, what, what, what was what's your personal background like? And um, what was your personal motivation? If I could mm -hmm. say it in another way, what was the big why <laughs> that made you start this journey? Thank you so much. Well, not quite four decades, but we're on the threshold of that. 38 years now. Um, wow. Hmm, what's the big why? Interestingly, even when the big why came, it wasn't about starting a school. Mm. It was about training my daughter, right? Mm. And you know the way it is with young parents. They seem to want, well, they want the best for their children. And they claim to, 
to or pretend that that's the word pretend to know everything about education and so they go here and they say no 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 that's not good enough that's mm -hmm. not good enough as if they knew everything about education so that was my own story mm -hmm. starting point and so for that reason i started researching early childhood education wow and the process of that i came across the montessori method of child education and i thought oh this is exciting mm -hmm. this looks like exactly what i need for my daughter so what did i do I then decided to leave my job. At that point in time, I already had a degree from the university in geography, actually. And I had, um, I was articled to a firm of chartered accountants, mm. trying to become an accountant. <laughs> but really, I never got past even the first term. I didn't write any exams. I then decided that, look, maybe I should go and train in the Montessori method of child education. So that was the beginning of the journey. Mm. So I went out to the UK and got a diploma in childhood education, mm. the Montessori method. And um, hmm, whilst there, I realized that um, this was really what I wanted. I wanted to be able to impact you know, the lives of children. Preschool, I thought, that was the dream. Really. Mm. That was the dream, preschool, wow. because Montessori was so was such a wholesome experience and and so when i got back to nigeria hmm, i quickly registered in well in a school i went to work as a teacher but i couldn't last there because already i had imbibed the montessori method you know the culture that culture and most schools don't really practice montessori yeah. they really do even though they may have the label they don't yeah. and so i had to quickly start a school mm. awesome uh, yeah and as i would say when you start a school <laughs> your first customers <laughs> are your family members mm -hmm. or your friends mm -hmm. because really nothing to go by except that okay we love you so we just have our children and so my sister donated two children to me <laughs> donated that's what i'll use because really and so that was the way it started <laughs> Oh, wow. I can see so much of, of myself in you because when I was also going to start a school, you know, it was because based on my own need, then I realized that other people had the same need that I had. And of course, it gave back to, to the school. And of course, it was preschool and it is still preschool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. So I can imagine the many years of working in this, um, this sector, you will have seen, you know, the education sector evolved, you know, 38 years, I would say 40, because you're already <laughs> there. You know, in 40 years, you've seen it evolve. What will you say were your own greatest challenges, you know, as you started and, you know, when you started, even on the journey in this period, how, you know, how did you navigate staffing, government policies, you know, all the works of starting and running a, a, a school business? Um, the school started, well, staffing, of course, it had to do with um, training. I mean, that has to be the focus. Mm -hmm. And of course, with the Montessori method, it was important that I um, handle that myself at that point mm -hmm. in time, because there were no centers to train mm -hmm. within Nigeria, or that I knew anyway, at that time. And so it was easy, but then you must also realize that when you start a school, you are the Initially, you are the all in all. You are the teacher, assistant teacher, cleaner, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. nanny, whatever. All of it rolled into a driver, mm -hmm. cook, mm -hmm. you know, and that was the way it was. And so that was how that journey started. And of course, you also had challenges with parents because here you are telling them that your child doesn't need to know until 1000 mm -hmm. at age three, by age three, that one to 10 is just enough. Once the child knows one to ten, then you then build up from there, and they'll argue with you. And your child doesn't, you know. And of course, these children that can recite one to two hundred, when you ask them, show me one, they may not be able to show you. They can't or, identify or you pick the one. number from the middle. Yes, they <laughs> may not be able to. So I mean, so gradually, also winning over the parents, mm. and so you find that the first set of parents that will come are those whose um, 
maybe a house is close by yeah. and it's just convenient for them to leave the children mm -hmm. there. Not because not, yeah, not because they believe in not it. because they believe in it. Mm -hmm. But over time you find that you start attracting people that believe in exactly what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Especially maybe after like two, three years when the children start reading and they're surprised. Mm -hmm. How? Aha. Uh -huh. And they you let them know that you see. The letters of the alphabet, not A, B, C, D. No, 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 no. You learn the sounds of the letters of the alphabet and then you string it together. And so really they can come across words that they've never seen before mm -hmm. and they'll try to put those letters together, the sounds together mm -hmm. and form a word. And so that was the way it all started and gradually um, it grew. As for government policies, hmm, interesting. We're told that, you know, I mean, you have to, you have to start the school first before even registering, mm. you know, with the government and so. But then you find people coming in to even inspect what you have not, you know, registered, so to say. And it was a difficult journey. But then with confidence, because I had all the equipment there, I came prepared, you know, from the UK. I brought all my materials and the school started, you know, really with a bang, I would say. Mm. And um, over the years, there had been challenges because there were things, you know, that I didn't know. Mm. For instance, you know, most of us that go out to start baby schools or especially schools, you find that we are passionate about what we do. But then there are attendant things that need to, administrative issues that needs, that we need to take care of. But we, we lose sight of that. Mm. We continue with our passion, keep pushing passion. forward. The passion keeps us going, mm -hmm. but really, we have, that has to be supported. Yeah. <laughs> it has, has to, to be, be a balance. Yeah. It has to be sustainable. And so, I mean, ran into a few hitches here and there, but then what I realized is that it is important for one to engage um, consultants or specialists in mm. certain areas, or maybe have a mentor. I didn't have one at that time, or maybe have a mentor that will guide, you know, I mean, that may point you uh, to what you need to know and uh, what you need to pay attention to apart from your passion, which is great. I mean, passion is good. It's good. Mm -hmm. And it has sustained us mm -hmm. right up to this point. Mm -hmm. right. Amazing. You know, and I could, I could even imagine at that time where you had parents that, of course, you have some early adapters. You have people that are just waiting to criticize. And eventually they become converts, mm -hmm. you know, like I told you in my own house, you have a great convert in my <laughs> husband. There's nothing your Green Spring School can do that, uh, <laughs> that would make him think otherwise. So I can imagine that level of uh, so much intentionality and the ability of, for your school mm -hmm. to have grown over the years such that people just trust the brand even when you are not there. I can imagine the feeling, you know, having... Um, people that really really didn't believe in you and now they are converts of your brand you know like I said I, I have people like that in my house my <laughs> husband is just a fan of Green Springs school and you know, I don't, I'm not sure what they would do to make him change his mind about you know the standard and you know, all that you do at the school but you know I, I'm just imagining that uh, what would you think is your in your own experience is uh, the importance of uh, community collaboration, parents, even schools and the children, the students and the teachers in, you know, growing your school community. Engagement with the community is key because really, I mean, there's something you're selling, so to say, and you need to let the people know, including the teachers, because they are part of the community. They're your internal stakeholders whilst the parents and the students are the external stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And so they must understand what you're doing or what you're trying to do to be able to buy in. Mm -hmm. Because when they're buying, then they will support you. Even, I mean, when they see areas where things are, where you're dropping the ball or whatever, they will be the ones to come and tell you about it. And you'll pick it up from there and you continue to grow. So it is very important. I know that some schools are so scared of having, for instance, PTAs, yes, yes. Uh, parents yes. teachers association. Yes. But we were early, very early adapters mm. of PTAs. And our PTAs have been very, very 
supportive. Mm. Very supportive, extremely, I must say. Would I say you're lucky? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it depends on the engagement. Okay. You know, it depends on the engagement and, and the sense of community that you've been able to build. Mm. It is so important. When once, once they know that they will be heard, that's not mm. to say that they won't have a bad word to say, no. Mm. But when they say it, you take it in good faith. And when they say something that is not correct, you correct it. You let them know mm -hmm. that, no, that is not the narration. This is what it is. You know, so that's just the way it is. Yeah. I agree. Adrian, I would also ask you this question uh, around the students. And I, I know that uh, Green Springs is, uh, is a thinking school. And I know that each year, you know, you, you get bigger in that direction. Um, over the years, have you been able to adapt? You know, what strategies have you used to adapt? to changes in educational standards mm -hmm. and curriculum. We know that you know, today is different from tomorrow and yesterday is far gone. How do you have, you, what strategies have you used to, to adapt to those changes? Well, I mean, continuous improvement and innovation is what we believe in. Mm -hmm. So we continue to reinvent ourselves and in fact, to get ahead of the next Hmm. <laughs> breaking news, so hmm. to say, in education. So, yeah, so I mean, yes, we, we, we try to. And of course, I mean, with the issue around the thinking school, you find that, I mean, the fundamental um, knowledge that anybody, children, adults need, is the ability to be able to think hmm. critically. Hmm. For instance, when we started, I said, um, I was one of those that probably thought, oh, Jack one day built all these ramshackle mm. schools and stuff, you know, but that later, you know, I came to appreciate mm. what he had done. So if I had thought through it critically, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been in that position. Mm -hmm. I would have applauded what he did mm -hmm. at the time. And so it is important and we recognize that. And so thinking skills is embedded right from preschool, actually, mm. right from preschool. They need to know, I mean, they look about their thinking hearts, what sort of questions should you ask? And of course, never to, you know, condemn anything outright. You know when you need to put up your thinking heart, when you need to question, when you need to, you know, put forward a statement and things like that. So they're taught, they're prepared. And so no matter what innovations come mm -hmm. to play, you need to be able to reason and think through them to be able to apply. Mm. And that's why it is so fundamental to all that we do. Mm. So I can imagine that what you have just said is that a school like Green Springs has modeled that thinking, you know, that thinking skill before they even share it with the children. So what you are saying is that if before any innovation comes up, you have thought ahead of it and you're already there. And you are teaching those, those same skills to children to be able to think you know, because if you look at today's world, you know, if I look at my own culture, you know, you, know, you want an obedient child, a child that will just say yes to everything, mm -hmm. you know. But what I'm hearing you say is that you are building a total child, a child that can say no when he needs to say no, you know, even though every other person is saying yes. And to actually to be able to think outside the box. And I think that's really phenomenal. Yeah, and, yeah that's, that's a, a, it's a and, good point. And in fact, that's the experience of most parents. I mean, they know that our children are able to speak up. Mm. In fact, there's a story about the children going on summer holidays, you mm. know, going to the British Embassy, especially, you know, for visas, and there were quite a number of them. And the one whose turn it was went into the, well, I don't know what to call them, visa officer anyway, <laughs> and said, I mean, sir, there are many Green Springs children here mm. waiting for their visa. Um, mm. I want you to know that they're all going to come back. You know the fear of this yeah. officer is that they're going to run away and jack <laughs> That we love our school mm -hmm. and we're going to come back. We're all coming, but mm -hmm. we're just going on holidays. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, how, what level of boldness mm -hmm. is that to address an immigration officer in that way uh, and to speak on behalf of your schoolmates? Mm. You know, it's just yeah. those amazing. Are the, those are the dividends of the quality curriculum. Mm. It's mm. beyond, like yeah. you said, it's beyond um, one to one thousand. <laughs> <laughs> just allowing children to be able to think about the book. Yeah. In, I, I know that in, in, in starting running and growing a school, there are many ups and downs. Mm. 
And for me, I think uh, when I think of the uh, ops, you might think, oh, I, I, I don't think I want to go ahead. But there are many memorable moments. There are many moments that you think about and it gives you the inspiration to just forge ahead, to just continue. You know, can you share with us some of those moments that just <laughs> keeps you going, you know, when you think about them? Hmm. Maybe I'll share the bit about when the Lucky School was starting. Mm. Hmm. That's a beautiful campus. <laughs> Thank you. It dragged and dragged and eventually we decided to start. However, it wasn't ready. Mm. The school was not, I mean, the hostels were not ready. But we were determined that, look, it's January, we're going to start. Even though the school year started in September, we housed them at the Anthony campus, whatever. We didn't inform the parents. Mm. We just told them school was going to start. So bring your children. So they all brought their children to school, to the Lucky School. Mm. Then we had um, the teachers and myself, you know, we took them around the campus. Mm. You can imagine what it was like in 2007. Mm. You know, wow. we took them around. They loved what they saw. And when they had settled down, they now said, well, <laughs> that the boarding house wasn't ready. Mm. And so that we were going to lodge the children in a hotel. But the amazing thing, and when, that's where you know that people trust your brand, yeah, well, your vision is, is that speaking. not one person took the child back home. Mm. They left the children with us. That for me was a wow moment mm. because, you know, I mean, of course we were apprehensive, <laughs> not knowing exactly what was going to happen. I mean, because mm. someone would say, why didn't you tell her? Mm. But that didn't happen. Mm. They all were just so pleased with what they had seen. And I assured them, well, actually, I didn't, did I tell them? I'm not sure, I can't remember now. But I made sure I stayed with the children in the hotel. Mm, I was okay. with them, I, there were staff there, but I was also there with them. I'm not sure if I told the parents mm. that, but then I was also there with them and we bussed them to school. Mm. In the, the classrooms were ready. The hostel just needed maybe about two weeks of work mm. before it would be ready for, you know, and so, I mean, that for me was, was a wow moment. Wow. And I think when we had our first graduates, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, we had um, the graduation ceremony, I wept right through, you mm -hmm. know, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> tears of joy, I imagine. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes Yeah, that, you know, something that started with just three children yeah. and have this. Hon thousands of thousands children now. now. So, so from three to thousands. Yes, thousands that's, now. Thank that's you. amazing. I, I would say that's sheer grace. Grace. Yes, absolutely. Grace. As you approach the later stages of your career, what are your hopes and aspirations for the future of the school industry? You have your school, so one, your school, and then the educational sector. How do you see your legacy living on? I'll probably start with my legacy. Yes. And right from inception, I'd always um felt that you know the best way for the legacy to live on is for the school to become public i mean not a public school yes. i mean to go to the um, stock market yes, and that is what we're going to do at some mm. point in time wow. because then you, you can be sure of an enduring legacy mm. so it's beyond you it's beyond me i mean and because, I mean, the, the vision is to educate the Nigerian child, the African child, you know. And for you to be able to do that, you need to be able to reach as many as possible. Mm -hmm. So this one is beyond me. Even as it is now, it is beyond me. Mm -hmm. And um, I pray that that dream comes true, mm -hmm. you know. I pray that it comes true. But maybe something I didn't share earlier is that to be able to also achieve that vision over the years, we've done things that will stretch our reach. Mm. I mean, this is just one school in Lagos, in one corner of Lagos, mm. and you're saying you want to reach the African child, I mean, the children of Nigeria, the entire Nigeria. So what we did was that we, we 
have annually what we call the open house. Mm. Now, this open house is an opportunity for teachers and parents, mainly teachers really, mm. from wherever to come into our school, to go around, to see what we do, ask questions about how we do it, and hopefully take something of what we do away with them to use in their own schools. So that way we will be extending our own reach to reach those children in Maiduguri or wherever, um, in Onisha and all of that. Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, that was also part of, you know, yes, of giving back and the dream. And indeed, I mean, at times we have up to 3,000 people coming in for that event. I have come for, for a couple myself. Oh, <laughs> oh I see. <laughs> oh, okay. So um, that's really amazing. And I think that um, giving back is, is, a, is a good legacy for you to have. That, you know, it's not just about, you know, you or your immediate environment, but you are really interested in the development of the Nigerian child. Mm -hmm. That's uh, so that we should say thank you. <laughs> thank you really for opening the doors because even for me, once I hear that there's an open house, I send out my own personal invitation. So you think I'm a green strength. <laughs> I'm a staff of your school because I'm sending out to say, make sure that Saturday is open. Anthony campus is open. Go and look, take pictures. And you know, the way you just allow people to come into the school and take pictures. You know, are you not just afraid of, you know, your your trade secrets, like they will say, you know, going out. Because you see, I remember that I grew up with my aunt and um, she started a school. And uh, when she started a school in an estate in, in, in Lagos, there were, there were no schools in that estate. Today, there are like nine schools in just an... And the estate is like maybe just two streets. <laughs> so it's not like it's the whole of Lekki or, you know, it's just a small estate and there are nine schools. You know, and so a lot of schools have this challenge of how do we keep up? How do we differentiate ourselves? How do we stay in the business? And, you know, you have grown your business from just uh, two children or three children to thousands, thousands. And you're still forging strong. Now you're thinking of going to the stock market. How have you been able to differentiate yourself over that time? You know, we don't mind if you share some of those traits <laughs> with us. <laughs> No, I mean, um, I, I'll say we continue to reinvent ourselves. That's mm. it. But I, but I also think the relationship mm. with your community yeah. is key. It's very, very important with the parents, the children, and the staff. That relationship is very important. So I mean, I'll say that's what it is. And so we know um, what we want to achieve. And we keep forging ahead. We keep forging ahead, you know, to achieve it, to actualize what we're trying to do. And maybe I just want to take you back to the issue of giving back. Mm. We also ensure that the children, because we, we, we are aware that the children that come to us are privileged children. Mm. So we, we want them to know that there are children out there mm. who only by virtue of their birth um family mm. are out there and they are in here so it's a privilege and so they need to learn to give back mm. and so we have opportunities like that for the children and one of such is i mean a fun way of raising money mm. we get them to come to school in their mouth you know children like to show you know rather than wear school uniform for mm. one day in mm. a term they put on their you know their mufti their latest jeans or whatever mm. you know and for that, they pay 1,000 Naira. Mm. And this money we put together, mm. and there's a committee of the teachers and the students that decide what to do with that money. Invariably, we give the money to schools, public schools. And when that is going to happen, we don't give them money. We do something. Either build a classroom block or something like that. We don't give mm. cash. Mm. The children themselves will go with their teachers to do, you know, mm. to do the presentation, you know, so that they, they can also imbibe the culture of giving. Mm. They must know that there are children out there that are not as privileged as they are. So it is important. It's a culture that we're trying to, you know, inculcate mm. 
and build on that. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I always also think in that direction that empathy has to be taught. You know, of course, people see, but you have to be de deliberate in teaching those mm. skills mm. as well in the schools. Mm. Thank you very much. So you see, technology, I want to ask a question about technology. I know that the school is a very techy school. Uh, and every day, technology is changing our own world. You see, how has it, that change impacted your school? You know, I'm sure you won't talk of the time of COVID, pre-COVID, COVID, and even post-COVID. How has it, how did it impact your school? I know mm. that a lot of schools during that time struggled, mm. you know, because technology, even though technology has been changing our world, but it, we just didn't, it didn't find it a way into the education industry well enough. But today, we see that there are lots of changes. You know, with your own experience, how did um, how has technology um, reshaped? <laughs> you know, you know the curriculum reshaped your your processes. How has it affected your school positively or negatively? <laughs> well, both actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> both actually. Um, Pre-COVID, we had already revived mm. technology. In fact, at some point in time, um, we had brought in laptops for all the children in the school. Mm. But that process did not work. You know, so some things work, some don't work. You know, I mean, we just couldn't keep up with the repairs and you know, dumping the you know children being careless with laptops. I mean, they didn't quite understand how to manage that, mm. you know? So we already had that, and then COVID struck. So for us, it was almost seamless going online. It was seamless. We just needed to, maybe the curriculum, I mean, to adapt our own curriculum to an online structure, and that was fine. So it wasn't a problem. But beyond even tutoring, you find that a lot of the um, support systems in the school has to be digitized. And that we're doing, I mean, we've done some, we're doing, you know, and we continue to do it. I mean, it's, it's here to stay mm. and it can only get better, I would say, because it's meant to improve our world. Yes. But then I'm not an advocate for full online. Mm. No, I think we are social beings yes. and we need to be able to socialize. Mm -hmm. Yes, we should integrate it, but not on a um, full basis, so mm -hmm. to say. Yes. Right? In yeah. fact, you know, we had an experience recently. Going to the Lekki campus has been quite mm -hmm. challenging mm -hmm. lately. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, and for uh, final year students who need to stay back for extra classes, some were getting home as late as nine o'clock, some ten o'clock, you know, because of the challenges on the road. So we just said, look, let's that class, let's change it to an online class for mm -hmm. them. So that they can go home mm -hmm. and, I mean when school closes and then we have maybe like an evening <laughs> class mm -hmm. later in the day yeah. online. So for as long as um that challenge mm -hmm. on the road continues, that's what we're going to do. So yeah, but on but on the bad side. Mm -hmm children the children i mean maybe not the children because the world has created all sorts of contents <laughs> online which children they find exciting intriguing you know and so innocently get into all sorts of things you know you know i mean but what we need to do is to educate them i mean of course put filters on the system so that they can't access certain things but they are smarter than us, mm. so they can bypass the splitter mm -hmm. filters and get what they, they are want. Tech, they are tech na natives. Uh, yes, they are natives, <laughs> and, <we're laughs> and so. But then we just have to keep trying. That, that's not to say that no tech. No, mm. no, 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 no. We can't stop it. It's mm. you know, it's okay, it's, it's on. Yeah. We have to continue with it. Yeah. There know? are lots of positive. Uh, there are lots of more positive uh, yeah. than negative. Actually, it's just, it's just that the uh, also unintended consequences of introduction of tech. Or it just has to be man identified first. Know the positive, uh, the possible, you know, uh, yes, and then be there to manage, you know, that situation. So I think also it's not just about the school. Then now also has a lot of uh, responsibilities also on parents to make sure that they have uh, media rules and regulations in their home because if you're having uh, after school online, 
they can be online and you know like you said they're ahead of you <laughs> they are doing so many other things so i think the responsibility is now on the parents to mm. to to check the back end of what their children are doing precisely yeah and i do advise of course that such online whatever mm. suffering even should we should be in a public place mm. not in their bedrooms yes. so those are the media so that when you that pass through have. i mean you are just screen about your own Mm. Or oh, even though they know when they send you are moving mm. around, they just click something. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Mm. The world of teenagers, ah. right? Let's talk a little about tax and regulations. Mm. Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can you share one impact or you know on on compliance or non-compliance on your school? Maybe in the past, something you know you didn't comply and how it affected you or complied let's just talk a bit about tax and regulations well complied or not complied i mean we, we felt that um the tax laws um affecting i think educational no no, no it does not say educational it says um, um organizations with public impact mm -hmm. means that you don't pay tax i mean as educational institutions mm -hmm. but then so many schools went to court mm -hmm. And God said that we have to pay, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, but for me, yes, I mean, so we're trying to, we're still in the process of complying in the mm. sense that we now, I mean, we're saying that those years that we were not liable, you know, paying tax, for, so we'll see what that will be. But I'm saying to governments now, mm. it's an opportunity mm. that, I mean, I don't think in a country where half, I mean, 20 million, they said, are out of school. And where, um, where we're thinking in terms of production and keeping money within this nation, then entrepreneurs in the educational sector should be encouraged yes. and not discouraged. Mm. You know, they should be encouraged. And so all those tax issues should be Don't out be of taxing. the way. No, it sh there shouldn't be any taxes because I mean, if we're able to improve um, the education here, I mean, maybe, okay, for taxes, maybe they're going to get 20 billion, mm -hmm. let's say. However, if we keep all those children that are going abroad in Nigeria, I think they'll make over 100 billion, mm -hmm. you know? And there'll be work, there'll be jobs for people and all of that, you know? So it has a multiplier effect on the economy itself. Mm -hmm. And so we shouldn't be myopic and think of, you know, all those small small drops in the ocean of taxing educational institute that are trying you know to improve the nigerian child you know yes so, I'll so say they that. should look for ways to even support the economy that you know give us grants system. we need yes. grants i i support you ma. <laughs> <laughs> okay yes. ma. so i'd like to ask this question what advice would you give to aspiring or even uh, entrepreneurs that have been in this journey and are thinking of quitting or they've just started, they want to grow their business. What advice will you give to that one person out there who's really thinking about this education sector uh, to grow or to scale? What would you say to them? First, it's a tough sector. Mm. You have a lot to deal with. You have the parents, mm. you have the children, you have the staff. It's not for the lily so lily <laughs> No, it's not for the lily livet. <laughs> However, it is, um, I forgot the word to use now, well satisfying. Yes, it has great yes. rewards. It's rewarding. It's, it's really rewarding. That's the word. It's rewarding, you know, um, both to you as a person mm -hmm. and then to your community. Yeah. And the community, of course, as I described them, the parents, the students, the staff, mm -hmm. it's very, very rewarding. So don't give up. It is worth it, but you must be resilient. Mm. To scale, I always advise people to try and as much as possible to grow organically. Mm. Mm. Because the banks are not quite mm. friendly. <laughs> and, um, and as much as possible too, in the early days or even before one starts off, try and get, you know, some consultants you don't mm. need to go for the very expensive ones but people that know a little bit more 
about administration, um, um, accounting, and things like that mm. to guide, you know, so that I mean you're able to um, order your keep your books properly. Yes. Very important because if at the beginning of term you think that you have ten million, so you are rich, mm. and you go to Dubai to mm. buy, I don't mm. know what it is. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Forgetting that you have expenses, mm -hmm. you have Salaries, staff to pay, rent. you have you know bills, Overheads. other bills to pay, mm -hmm. you know, then you get into trouble. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, people just need guides. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that, mm -hmm. and I think that I mean it's created some challenges for me. So I will advise that that is very very crucial mm -hmm. on this journey. Yeah. Well, you've been asking me a lot of questions. Now it's my turn. The table is now turn. Yes. I'm a believer in names, you know. Mm. I mean, Green Spring School, for mm. instance. There's a reason behind that name for me. Anyway, you know. And I look at the name of your child care center, Extra Kids. Mm. What, why did you choose that name? And how has that impacted you know your vision mm. for the center mm. i'm as well a believer <laughs> as you are <laughs> i also believe in the importance of names you know just some days ago i was uh, trying to convince a lot of people to bear my name and all for that <laughs> it does bring a lot of benefits and i think that uh, one of the reasons why the main reason the word extra o is from the is uh, extraordinary so it's just coined from that word and when you think about that, that is, um, you know, a, a, an out of the world environment. So when I started the preschool, even though the name I had been using it a prior business when I was in the university, then when I wanted to start a preschool, I just thought, no, this is just the name to go on with. So it means extraordinary. You want to provide extraordinary service. You want to provide an extraordinary space, extraordinary experience for the children as well as um uh the and as well as their families because it's not just about the children you want to have you know out of this world experience and i think you know that name has actually driven us to do the things that we do you know to keep evolving to wanting to always you know start where we are but keep improving that process so excellence quality will be in our core values because of that name and you know, some of our friends will just joke and say, mm, you are truly extra old. Mm -hmm. You know, that word, even for well, the teachers, it just sticks on them. They just do things differently because, you know, the name is actually following us. Yes, yeah. I agree. Thank you, Ma. Yeah, I wish you all the best, really. Thank you so much. This is a good sign, you know. <laughs> a small entrepreneur with a big entrepreneur. <laughs> small will become big. Yes, yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> Thank Definitely. you, Mom. Thank you, Ms. Laikoiki, for you know being here and for sharing so much wealth today. I am really inspired and fired up for the next phase of my life. And I'm sure that all the viewers, everyone that has watched this today, are also inspired to take action and to continue to contribute to our education sector. Thank you and see you at the next podcast session. Thank you for watching this episode of Journeys in Entrepreneurship. This interview was recorded on the 22nd of September 2023 at Faith Foundation's office in Ilupeju, Lagos. We look forward to hearing about your aha moment in the comment section below and watch out for the next episode. Bye!